Welcome to the Human Rights Day seminar organized by the Research Committee 26 um, of the um, he, he, Research Committee 26 of the Human Rights of the International Political Science Association and the Gregorio Pérez Barba Human Rights Institute um, of the um, Carlos III University of Madrid and the Adam Mickiewicz University of uh, Poland. It's my pleasure to say a few words as a chair of the Research Committee 26 on Human Rights of the International Political Science Association, IPSA. Um, we would like to, to set up a new tradition is in this research committee uh, to celebrate the Human Rights Day with a seminar and we consider that uh, a current um, issue on uh, human rights that could be uh, could pay attention to the to the to the scholars and to the academic community and also to the people in general uh, every day could be analyzed in this uh, seminar in this case i think uh, uh, the news, the headline news, uh, talk about the Ukraine war. Every day we have news about, about the Ukraine war um, in Europe, uh, generally. I imagine that in Poland and in Ukraine, you have every day a lot of news about uh, this, but also in Spain, we have a lot of news about the Ukraine war. I would like to say uh, only two points. I would like to make some remarks about this. Um, uh, the first point is that in the organization of this event, we have tried academic impartiality, but has not been finally possible because this is a war. And we want to hear all voices but uh, sometimes this is not always possible for different reasons and uh, i think not, it's not the moment to explain uh, these uh, reasons but free speech is not possible um, in all countries in the same way and people are not free to talk in in all countries and this is something important in order to organize an academic event second uh, uh, academic impartiality is not the same as neutrality in a war. Uh, and this neutrality in this war is not des desirable. I think we, we have not to be neutrals in, the, in this Ukraine war. Um, and of course, the speakers are going to talk about this. Finally, the second point is that in these new seminars of the Human Rights Day, we would like to combine theory and practice. We would like to combine um, academy and activism on human rights. And uh, this uh, event has been organized uh, under this approach. We hope uh, the organizers of this event, um, we hope uh, that uh, we can organize future events with different topics, analyzing human rights from theory and practice. And this will be a new tradition for the Research Committee 26 on Human Rights of the International Political Science Association. I would like to especially thank to Professor JJ Spiriktat of the Adam Mickiewicz University, because he has made uh, the arrangements um, to organize uh, these events. And uh, today he will be the moderator of this event. And I would like especially uh, uh, to thank all his uh, efforts and his involvement in, the, in this event. Thank you very much. And now is your turn in JJ. <laughs> Uh, Oscar, thank you very much uh, for, for this introduction uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I would like to welcome uh, welcoming uh, our uh, dear guest. Uh, let me allow to to to, to welcome uh, our guest uh, from uh, Ukraine. Uh, I'm sorry for my Ukrainian. However, dziękuję za wasz uczest u webinarii. Mieć się w bokowrażeni waszym heroizmom i mużnictwiu. 
it was in Ukrainian. Uh, so um, we have uh, three uh, excellent speakers uh, from uh, Ukraine, Ludmila Denisova, uh, chairman of the board of uh, the Ukrainian Human Rights uh, Center. Um, and fortunately, Mikola Kuleba uh, today is absent, uh, CEO in Save Ukraine. However, we have Yevgeny Yeroshenko, uh, um, analyst from uh, organization Crimea SOS, and uh, Olesia Nikolenko, um, officer in uh, um, media uh, center of uh, um, office of uh, uh, public uh, prosecutor in Ukraine. I hope uh, that uh, she will uh, join in this session. And uh, we have also brilliant uh, speakers uh, from uh, Spain and uh, uh, Poland. Let me uh, introduce uh, Professor Carlos Fernandez Liesa, Professor of Public International Law and International Relations at the Carlos III University of Madrid, and uh, Professor uh, Bartosz Hordecki from my uh, university. So, um, Human Rights Day is observed uh, every year on 10 December, the day the United Nations General Assembly adopted in 1948 the Universal, Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Uh, so, this uh, milestone document, which proclaims uh, the inalienable rights uh, that everyone is entitled to as a human being, regardless of race, color, religion, sex, language, uh, political and other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth and other status. Uh, we celebrate uh, the Human Rights Day uh, 9th of December because uh, this year, 10th of December, will be on Saturday. Uh, so it is the reason why we celebrate uh, this day, day before in the uh, Human Rights Day Eve. So we must uh, also explain that uh, when I think about uh, celebrating this day, uh, RC26 uh, always uh, think that we should uh, um, focus on some uh, uh, trouble on this uh, area. Uh, this year, the United Nations uh, 2022 theme of this day is dignity, freedom and justice uh, for all. Uh, 2022 uh, the RC26 IPSA theme is uh, a situation of human rights in uh, during the war in Ukraine. We should remind uh, that uh, pursuant to the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, according to Article 3, everyone has the right to life, liberty and security of person. And Article 5, no one shall be subject to torture or to cruel, unhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. So uh, mm, we must remember that according to the Office uh, of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, United Nations, uh, from 24 February, uh, 4 a.m. to 4 December 2022, uh, almost uh, 18,000 civilian casualties uh, was killed during this war. Um, probably more, however, this is uh, official uh, data from uh, the Office of High Commissioner for Human, uh, Human Rights. This meeting will be attended by representatives of academy and science, as well as the world of practice. I think that uh, such uh, collaboration, this is very worthy and uh, could be very fruitful for, for all uh, of us. So uh, let's uh, go to, the, uh, to, the, to our uh, distinguished uh, speakers. And uh, maybe I would like, uh, as a first person, uh, I would like to invite Professor Carlos Fernandez Liesa, Professor of Public International Law and International Relations at the Carlos III University of Madrid, 
Uh, he has director, uh, directed the Mario Villaroy Chair of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights since 2011. He is a member of the expert role appointed by Spain of the Moscow Mechanism of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. He is the director of uh, the expert degree in international crisis uh, prevention and management uh, that uh, is made between uh, the Francisco de Vitoria Institute of International and European Studies and the Army War College. I will ask uh, Professor Yesa to present uh, the situation in Ukraine, to war in Ukraine, from the point of view of uh, international law and the standard of human rights protection. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining this session. Thank you once again. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the moderator, uh, Jerzeg Skrivsak, uh, sorry for my pronunciation, maybe, and to thank uh, Professor Oscar Pérez de la Fuente to have invited me, Carlos Fernández Liesa. I am professor and, uh, at the University Carlos III of Madrid in public international law. To this round table, of the prestigious International Political Association to reflect on Ukrainian war from the point of view of human rights and international law. First of all, it has to be said that the present war is very sad from the point of view of suffering people, of people, of innocent victims of war. Apart from that, we are facing a war of other epochs. We never thought in Europe we would see a similar war. The war is contrary to international law since 1945, and Russia was one of the creators of this new order of the United Nations. Then the present situation is worse because it's initiated by one of the guardians of peace in theory. How to find a way out of this situation? It's not easy. There isn't an answer. In any case, Russia, Russian aggression has been illegal and illegitimate. The value of peace is fundamental in public international law. Kant's dream of peace through law Breaking the peace is provided by Article 2.4 of the United Nations Charter. It's a norm of jus cogens. It is a crime of aggression. It is not a special military operation. The Russian excuse is an understatement. This has been stated by the United Nations by the General Assembly of the United Nations in the resolution of March 11 and in the resolution of 2 March in the 11th session with 141 votes in favor, 5 against and 35 abstention. The Assembly deplores but does not condemn the International Court of Justice has called on Russia to withdraw. It is obvious that it does not constitute an act of legitimate defense. The Security Council has been blocked by the veto privilege. The legal qualification of the war in Ukraine is that it constitutes an act of aggression. It is a breach of a customary international norm of a fundamental principle of international law that derives international criminal responsibility for those who have initiated it. Ukraine has the right of self-defense. There are also serious violations of international humanitarian law and human rights, non-observance of humanitarian law, it on both sides of the conflict. They can take place by attacking non-military targets, also for using 
prohibited methods and means of combat, also for attacking the environment or essential means for the life of the civilian population. There are evidence of this breach in the Ukrainian war, a major problem if it's a permanent threat of the conflict, a way to win the war for the complete destruction. This raises not only legal question, but part in the focus, the question of value at stake. Let us to reflect some minutes on this question. On the one hand, the tension between the values of peace and justice. Does peace fit any prior? It is possible to negotiate a illegal territorial annexation that violate use cohens? Can crimes be covered with impunity? Will the crimes be prosecuted? A diplomatic negotiation to reach a ceasefire or a treaty of peace would be good, but this poses the question of ethical and juridical limits, limits of that treaty. The Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties 1969 prohibits agreements contrary to use cohens. Hints a peace agreement without punishment for the crimes will be null and void. From the point of view of le legitimacy, the focus is if the war is legitimate. Why the value of peace is broken? There may be several reasons, such as the imperial soul of Russia and geopolitical reasons, but without any doubt, the determining factor is that Russia does not respect the principle of sovereignty of its neighboring states. In this sense, Russia wants to maintain a sphere of influence in its neighboring states, droit de regard, which is neither compatible nor coherent with the principle of sovereignty. Russia's behavior is not justified from the perspective of public international law. A failure of Western diplomacy, which did not know how to manage some issues, such as the Kosovo War, has also contributed to this war. The breach of international law in Kosovo in Iraq in 2003 war is what Russia has been point pointing out mutatis mutandis in Abkhazia, Ossetia, Georgia, or more recently in Donbass. None of this is justifiable, but neither was it in Yugoslavia. That Western not compliance from the United States and many European countries was a bad thing. International relations must always be based on respect for the principle of public international law and on multilateralism on supporting international organization. Other questions that the war are important in my view are the following. First of all, the war will provoke a historic rejection and a greater union of the Ukrainian nation and in the population of the state. In this, is similar to Spain when it was attacked at the beginning of the 19th century by France, giving rise to the war of independence. From other point of view of international law, international organization, such as the Council of Europe have expelled Russia. What is the best option? There is a debate. The European Union has adopted sanction measures. Will be they effective? Will they be enough? You can fight an army with economic sanction. It's hard. 
It must be said that the support of Ukraine with weapons, as well as economic support, is legitimate and in conformity with public international law. It constitutes contributing to the right of legitimate defense. Atlantic Alliance is afraid to enter the case, as it will lead to a third world war. The war in Ukraine show the international disorder. It's at stake the peace and the law in Ukraine and in the war. We have to restore international order. Otherwise, we will return to an international order of minimum like in classical public international law two or three centuries ago. It will, be, it will be a disaster for Ukraine, but also for humanity. The challenge of peace, but also sustainable development and environmental protection and human rights are all at stake. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hiesa, uh, for, for this uh, international law for uh, background uh, situation in Ukraine. And uh, now this is a great honor uh, uh, hosting uh, Ms. Ludmila Denisova, Chairman of the Board uh, of the Ukrainian Human Rights Center. Uh, may I ask you to present uh, the human rights situation, I, I'm sorry, human rights violation uh, in Ukraine after fall uh, a.m. February 24th, 2022. Uh, could you describe us uh, what uh, happened uh, and uh, how we can uh, uh, describe this situation? Ms. Denisova, the floor is yours, okay? Uh, microphone. Once again, thank you uh, for uh, joining this session. Uh, I'm sorry for my Ukrainian. Dziękuję za wasze uczest w webinarii. Dziękuję też wam za to, co zaproponowali. Dobrego wieczoru, my z Ukrainy. Thank you very much for offering me to participate. Good evening, we're from Ukraine. Так дійсно, 10 місяць вже в Україні триває ця війна, це повномасштабне вторгнення Російської Федерації в Україну, але ця війна почалася 8 років тому з Криму та Сходу України. Indeed it is a tense month that this war, this full-scale invasion of Russia into Ukraine is going on, but in fact this war has started earlier. It started from Crimea and it started from the eastern region of Ukraine, Donbass. І такі мероприятия, як зараз, цей вебінар, вони дуже важливі для України, для українців, для світу, тому що Російська Федерація робить це можливо, щоб світ не знав правду про злочини, які вчиняє її армія. And such events as we have today, such webinars are extremely important because Russian Federation does everything possible so that the world doesn't know about the crimes that its army is committing. І тому наше головне завдання, окрім гідної відсічі збройної агресії Російської Федерації, є притягнення до відповідальності всіх причетних, які створюють таку ситуацію, які надають, віддають накази і які виконують ці злочинні накази. This is why our task today is not only to fight back in the battlefield, to fight back the Russian army, but also to bring to responsibility everybody who gives out criminal orders and also people who fulfill those criminal orders. Ми всі разом з вами бачимо щодня, що робить Російська Федерація. Every day all of us see what the Russian Federation is doing. Але для того, щоб суди засудили цих злочинців, потрібні факти і підтвердження цих фактів. But in order for these criminals to be brought to responsibility in courts, we need facts and we need the evidence to support those facts. Щоденно ворог піддає масовим бомбардуванням зі зброєю масове ураження міста та села. Руйнує об'єкти цивільної інфраструктури, школи, дітсадки, лікарні, житлові будинки, магазини. Every day they are using weapons of mass destruction and they are doing mass shelling 
on Ukrainian territory, destroying schools, destroying kindergartens, shops, apartment buildings. Ведені російськими військовими обстріли в мирних міст зброєю, сурово забороненою міжнародним гуманітарним правом, це снарядами, з фосфорними та термобаричними боєприпасами, касетними бомбами і протипіхотними мінами. Russian Federation, Russian Army is using the munitions that are clearly banned by the international, uh, international conventions such as phosphor bombs, such as thermobaric bombs, uh, cluster bombs, uh, such as anti-personnel mines. Використання таких видів зброї широкого ураження проти мирного населення є злочином проти людяності і порушення Женевської конвенції 1949 року. Using these munitions against the civilian population is a crime against humanity and it is a violation of the Geneva Conventions of 1949. We also see that our nuclear power stations and our chemical plants are being shelled and this is done to cause the technological and environmental catastrophe. Це є прямим порушенням Конвенції про заборону військового або будь-якого ворожого використання засобів впливу на природне середовище. This is a direct violation of convention that prohibits to, uh, uh, to have any kind of enemy impact on the environment and also uh, any kind of war-related impact on such objects. Кожен з зазначених фактів складає під визначення злочину геноцид відповідно до Конвенції про запобігання злочину геноциду та покарання за нього статтєю 6 Римського статуту міжнародного кримінального права. And every, every of these crimes uh, is, can be uh, defined as genocide according uh, to the Article 6 of Roma Statute of the ICC. Мирне населення на сьогоднішній день у смертельній небезпеці і їхне право на життя порушено. Civilian population is today in grave danger and their right to life is violated. За офіційною статистикою Міжнародної комісії з ніклих безвісті налічується 15 тисяч зниклих безвісті українців. Але це дуже консервативна оцінка цієї кількості. According to the estimation of the International Commission of Missing Persons, there are about 15,000 Ukrainians that are currently missing, but these are very conservative evaluations. Сьогодні наразі не зрозуміло, скільки людей було насильно переміщене, утримуються під вартою в Росії, розлучені зі своїми сім'ями або померли і були поховані в імпровізованих могилах. We currently don't know how many people were forcibly moved we don't know how many of them are being imprisoned in Russia, uh, how many of them have been separated from their families or dead and buried in the improvised graves. Кожний ранок в нашій Україні починається з підрахунку, а скільки ж дітей загинуло на цю дату. І от на сьогоднішній ранок це 443 дитини, а постраждало 855. Every morning uh, in Ukraine starts from counting how many children have been affected by this war and as of today 443 children are dead because of this war and 855 children have been injured. Але фактично кількість загиблих і поранених дітей встановити зараз неможливо через те, що в українських містах окупаційні війська ведуть активні бойові дії. However, in fact, it is impossible to have the exact figure right now because the Russian army has active combat in the Ukrainian cities. Це безумовно для російських окупаційних військ і прямим порушенням права дітей України на життя та безпеку, гарантованих Гаагськими Женевськими конвенціями і конвенцією ООН про права дитини. Of course, these actions of the Russian army are a direct violation of the rights of children of Ukraine, of their rights for life and safety that are guaranteed by the Hague and Geneva Conventions and also the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. I want to illustrate you how we have lived three days, 7th, 8th and 9th of July. I want to illustrate to you a little bit how we lived through the last three days, two and a half days, basically December 7th, December 8th, 
and also the night before December 9. Протягом 7 грудня, за даними Генерального штабу, противник завдав 7 ракетних ударів і 16 авіаційних ударів. Здійснив понад 40 обстрілів з реактивних систем залпового вогню. During December 7, according to the data of the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, our enemy has uh, carried out seven rocket attacks, 16 aviation attacks, and over 40 shelling from the multiple rocket launch systems. Ворог атакував з авіації, з реактивної системи залпового вогню, з артилерійськими обстрілами мирне населене пункти Запорізької області. These attacks were committed against the civilian population of towns and villages of Zaporizhia Oblast. Росіяни позбавили 18 домівок, поцілівши в цивільну інфраструктуру. Загинули мирні мешканці. The Russians have damaged 18 buildings and there were also casualties among the civilian population. Того ж дня росіяни вбили 9 мирних жителів Донеччини. On the same day, the Russians killed nine civilians in Donetsk Oblast. And another 15 people in Donetsk Oblast were injured. On the 8th of June, the general staff, we have been attacked by rockets five times and three aviation attacks were also committed by the Russian army, as well as over 54 uh, shellings from the multiple rocket launch systems. Окупанти завдавали ракетних артилерійських ударів по Купянському, Харківському, Чугуївському, Ізюмському районах Харківської області. Купянськ, Харків, Чугуїв and Ізюм districts of Kharkiv Oblast were hit. За даними екстреної медичної допомоги, три людини госпіталізовані, є загибли 41, 41 рік і 64 років, і ще один чоловік 40 років перебуває в важкому стані. Three people have been hospitalized, uh, two women are in moderate state, and also there is a severely injured uh, man, 40 years old. Ще вбили п'ять жит... мирних жителів на Донеччині. We also know about five civilians who died in the Donetsk region that day. В ніч на 9 грудня ворог 68 разів обстріляв Херсонську область з мінометів, артилерії, танків та реактивної системи залкового вогню. On the night before December 9th, the enemy has shelled 68 times Kherson Oblast from mine throwers, artillery tanks, and multiple rocket launch systems. Зранку рашисти поцілили в будівлю лікарні у Херсоні, снаряди пошкодили дитяче відділення та мог. In the morning, the hospital in Kherson was hit, and the shelling damaged the pediatric department and the morgue. Правоохоронці Харківської області продовжують збирати докази злочинів армії нелюдів Російської Федерації. The law enforcement officers in Kharkiv Oblast continue collecting evidence about the crimes of uh, the soldiers of the army of the Russian Federation. Наразі на території регіону вже ексгумовано 651 тіла загиблих від рук російських окупантів цивільних. In the territory of Kharkiv Oblast as of now 651 bodies have been exhumed, and these are civilian people who died from the hands of the Russian soldiers. Серед них 20 дітей, 258 жінок, 343 чоловіка і 30 неідентифікованих. Among them are 20 children, 258 women, 343 men, and also 30 unidentified persons. Ще одну катівню рашистів виявили на недоокупованій території Херсонської області. In the deoccupied territory of Kherson Oblast, another torture chamber has been found. Під час окупації правобережжя області загарбники розмістилися в будівлі суду, де влаштували катівню для українців. When uh, the Russians occupied the right bank side of the oblast, they uh, had their torture chamber in the court building, and there they tortured Ukrainians. Камера стримання підсудних Окупанти незаконно отримували цивільних з проукраїнською позицією. They have illegally detained civilian people with pro-Ukrainian position. Зараз 
правоохоронці знайшли списки 112 громадян, які могли утримувати в цій будівлі і застосовувати до них фізичний та психологічний тиск. The law enforcement officers have found the list with 112 names of people who could have been kept in that building, experiencing physical and psychological pressure. Вбивство мирного населення, обстріли мирних міст та цивільних об'єктів армії України та агресора, використання таких видів зброї широкого ураження проти мирного населення є військовими злочинами і злочинами проти людяності. Such killing of civilian population, shelling civilian citizens, civilian objects by the army of the aggressor country using such kinds of weapons of mass destruction against civilian population are war crimes and crimes against humanity according to Articles 7 and 8 of the Roma Statute and the violation of the norms of the Geneva Conventions. Дуже небезпечна ситуація продовжується біля Запорожської АЕС. A uh, situation is very dangerous in Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Як повідомляє Енергоатом, вчора російські військові увірвалися до приміщення, в якому розташоване управління соціальних програм станції, то у присутності інших працівників сильно побили начальника управління та його заступника. According to Energoatom, yesterday the Russian military broke into the room Uh, of the Department of Social Programs of the station, and uh, with the other employees present there, they uh, beat up the head of the department and his deputy. And after that, the men were taken in the unknown direction. Uh, what they also did, uh, the occupants also took the head of the shift on the day, who is a licensed personnel and he is directly responsible for nuclear and radiation safety on the station. Расисти тиснуть на персонал станції, щоб змусити його виявляти лояльність до загарбників і укладати контракти з Розатомом. The rushes are pressuring the personnel of the station to make them uh, show loyalty to them and to make them sign contracts with Rosatom. Работа працівників станції в таких умовах загрожує безпеці всієї Європи, адже помилка у поводженні з обладнанням, вчинена в стані стресу, може призвести до катастрофи. When the personnel of the stations work in such conditions, this threatens the safety of the entire Europe because if when under stress they make a mistake when handling the equipment, it can lead to a catastrophe. Terror and catering of personnel are violent crimes, according to the Statute 6, 8th of the Russian Statute of the International Criminal Court. Terrorizing and torturing personnel is a war crime, according to Article 8 of the Roma Statute of the SEC. Виходячи з проведених розслідувань подій в Київській, Чернигівській, Харківській та Сумських областях, Незалежна міжнародна комісія, яка створена ООН з розслідування порушень в Україні, дійшла висновку, що в Україні було скоєно військові злочини. Без на інвестигаціях з виявлення в Києві, Чернігів, Харків і Суми області, The Independence International Commission of the UN that was created to investigate the violations in Ukraine has concluded that war crimes have been committed in Ukraine. The Commission has documented such violations as the unlawful use of weapons, 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 including the loss of torture, and the unlawful use of weapons, and also the sexual and gender violence. The Commission documented such violations as illegal use of weapons, of um, explosive weapons, that non-selective attacks, and also violating the inviolability of person, including um, killing, torture, violent handling, and also sexual and gender violence. The Commission has also established that the rights of children have been violated. Розслідування випадків сексуального та гендерного насильства показало, що деякі військовослужбовці Російської Федерації вчинили такі злочини, The investigation of uh, the cases of sexual and gender violence showed that some of the servicemen of the Russian Federation have committed these crimes. 
варьируется от 4 до 82 роков. The age of victims of sexual and gender violence uh, differs from 4 to 82 years old. Злочины сексуального характера, ускоренные российскими войсковыми, фиксуются у всех звільнених від окупантів регіонів України. The uh, crimes of sexual nature committed by the Russian military are documented in all liberated territories of Ukraine. Сексуальне насильство, яке коїла Російська Федерація, це є публічне висловлення, утримання разом чоловіків і жінок. Це огляд жінок не жінками, а чоловіками. Це тортура геніталій і так далі. Sexual violence is what committed by the military of the Russian Federation includes uh, publicly taking clothes of people, keeping men and women together, um, examining women not by women but by men, uh, torturing the genitals, and so on. Військова Російська Федерація застосовувала електрошок. Це коли електрострумом б'ють людину по різних частинах тіла, включаючи статеві органи, що завдає особливо жорстокого болю. The soldiers of the Russian Federation have used electrical shock. This is when electrical current is used to hit the person on different body parts, including uh, the sexual organs, and this causes extremely violent pain. They damaged the sex organs uh, up to cutting them off. They also broke the limbs, cut off the limbs. Побиття в зоні геніталії, удари по геніталіях електричним, електричним струмом, примус до оголення, необґрунтовані обшуки порожнин та інших ділянок тіла, загрози зґвалтування затриманих та їх близьких використовувалися як метод катувань та жорстокого поводжування для залякування, покарання чи примусу до визнання. Beating in the area of the genitals, hitting the genitals with electrical current, uh, making people undress, also unjustified searches of cavities and other body parts, uh, threats of um, sexual violence uh, against people detained and their relatives were used as a method of torture and uh, violent, violent holding to threaten, to punish or to make people admit something. Сексуальне насильство застосовувалося також до полонених українських військовослужбовців, які дали відповідні покази після їх обміну. Сексуал віоленс був також використовувався до імпризнення українських міліторів, до ПОВs, які спілкували про це, після того, як вони були вирішені від За різними оцінками, українським правоохоронцям відомо лише 1-2% сексуальних злочинів, скоєних окупантами під час збройної агресії Росії в Україні. According to different estimations, we now know about only 1 or 2% of sexual crimes that were committed by the occupants during the armed aggression of Russia in Ukraine. Правозахисники, які працюють саме з жертвами сексуального насильства, говорять, що їх в рази більше, 100 разів більше. Human rights professionals who work with victims of sexual crimes claim that there are hundreds, a uh, hundred times more of them. В ООН наголосили, що поки що не можуть дійти остаточних висновків щодо масштабів сексуального насильства, які відбуваються під час вторгнення РФ в Україну. The UN has stated that so far they have not been able to reach final conclusions on the scale of sexual crimes that are being committed during the Russian invasion into Ukraine. Але спеціальна представниця генерального секретаря ООН з питань сексуального насильства в конфліктах Праміла Патен чітко заявила, що російські військові, які роблять такі злочини, це є частина військової стратегії Російської Федерації. But the special representative of Secretary General on Sexual Violence and Conflict, Pramira Patton, has clearly said that uh, the crimes that the Russian soldiers are committing is a part of the military strategy of the Russian Federation. Коли жінок утримують цілими днями і гвалтують, коли починають гвалтувати маленьких хлопчиків і чоловіків, коли ти бачиш генітальне обрізання, коли чуєш, як жінки свідчать про російських солдатів, які мають з собою віагру, це явно військова стратегія. When women are being detained for entire days and raped for days on end, when little boys are 
raped and men are raped, when you see genitals cut off, when you hear how women uh, give evidence against the Russian soldiers who have Viagra with them, this is definitely a military strategy. І коли жертви розповідають, що було сказано військовими під час зґвалтування, це явно цілеспрямована тактика дегуманізації жертви. And when the victims say what the Russian military said during those rapes, this is a definitely a directed tactic for dehumanization of the victim. Це оцінка саме Праміли Патен. This is uh, the evaluation that Pramila Patton gave. Комісія ООН з розслідування підтвердила понад сотню злочинів на сексуальному ґрунті, скоєних російськими збройними силами України, і а реальна кількість таких злочинів за їх оцінками, ймовірно, набагато більша. The UN Commission on Investigation has confirmed over 1000 crimes on uh, sexual nature committed by the Russian armed forces in Ukraine, but the real number of such crimes is uh, possibly much bigger because very often they are not registered. Не можу не сказати, шановне панство, про примушену, примусову депортацію наших українців на територію Російської Федерації, яку вона почала ще 18 лютого за 6 днів до початку повномасштабного вторгнення. I also must mention the forced deportation of our population to the Russian Federation. It has been started even before the full-scale invasion on February 18th this year. За оцінками ВКПБ ООН було вивезено, депортовано, а по самостійно виїжджено громадян України до РФ 2 мільйона 852 тисячі 395 громадян. According to UN estimations, uh, people who were deported, Ukrainian citizens who were taken to Russia or deported, Possibly deported to Russia are 2,852,395 people. Russian Federation звітує про інші цифри. Вони говорять, що на територію Російської Федерації прибуло українців 3 мільйона 800 тисяч, з яких 705 тисяч це діти. The Russian statistics differ. Uh, they say that. Uh, in the Russian uh, territory of the Russian Federation, there are 3,800,000 Ukrainians who have arrived this year, and among them are 705,000 children. У мене є документи, які підтверджують, що саме ця кількість міст була підготовлена Російською Федерацією ще на початок 2000 22-го року для розміщення саме українців, які вона намагалася вивести з України на територію Російської Федерації. I have the documents that confirm that this is uh, the number of accommodation places that the Russian Federation has been preparing and these documents are dated early uh, January 2022. Uh, they prepare these places preliminary to try to take Ukrainians out of Ukraine and into Russia. У мене є підтверджуючі документи, що ще 18 лютого Російська Федерація вивозила сиріт з дітей сиріт, дітей позбавлених батьківського піклування з окупованих на той час територій Донецької та Луганської областей. I also have the documents confirming that on February 18th, starting from this date, Russian Federation has been taking uh, out orphans of the territories of Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast that were occupied at that time. Three categories, which were taken by Russian Federation, are children siroty, children who were deprived of parental care, that is, when the parents were deprived of their parental rights, and third, children who were deprived of their parental care, and third, children who were deprived of their parental care, and third, children who were deprived of their parental care, and third, children who were deprived of their children who were deprived of their parental care, and third, children who were deprived of their parental care, and third, children who also children who don't have parental care, which means that their parents were deprived of their parental rights, and also children who were orphaned uh, during the war. І ця депортація дітей в Російську Федерацію, вона означає геноцид українського народу. Чому я так говорю? And this deportation of children into Russian Federation means genocide of Ukrainian children. 
Why am I saying this? Дума країна агресора прийняла спеціальні закони, які спрощують процедуру усиновлення російськими громадянами українських дітей та спрощеної процедури набуття громадянства українськими дітьми у громадянство Російської Федерації. Duma, the Parliament of the Russian Federation, has adopted special laws that simplify the adoption of Ukrainian children by Russian citizens and also simplify uh, giving Russian citizenship to Ukrainian children. Примусове оформлення громадянства Російської Федерації українським дітям це є знищення української ідентичності, це є геноцид українського народу. By forcibly making these children adopt Russian citizenship, exactly what is done is a destruction of Ukrainian identity, and this is the genocide of Ukrainian people. Зараз я вам наведу просто факти, які можуть підтвердити, як фашисти поводили себе до інших громадян, які їм не завгодні. I will now cite you some facts on what the fascists have been doing to some other citizens. Починаючи з травня масово процедури усиновлення використовувались мешканцями Московської області. Вони усиновлювали наших дітей. Starting from May, people living in Moscow Oblast have been adopting Ukrainian children. Але потім, коли місяць-два наша дитина побула у них в родині, вони побачили, що вона має якісь захворювання або просто не подобається. But then, after Ukrainian children spent about a month or two in those families, the families saw that the children are somehow sick or maybe they didn't like the child. І почала застосовуватися процедура повернення. Тобто наших дітей почали повертати або в сиротські дома, Російської Федерації або вивозити на окуповані території Російської Федерації частини України. And uh, they started using the procedure of uh, giving back the orphans, sending them back to the orphanages. So either children were sent back to the orphanages or they were sent back to their territories of Ukraine that are currently occupied by Russia. І тепер Російська Федерація на законодавчому рівні запровадила процедуру вибраковки наших дітей. And now uh, at the legislative level, the Russian Federation have introduced the procedure of um, so sort of filtering Ukrainian children to identify the broken ones. Розпорядженням уряду Російської Федерації від 22 жовтня було прийнято рішення, щоб виділити МОЗ Російської Федерації надати субсидії Донецької Народної Республіки, Луганської Народної Республіки, Херсонської областям, надати субсидію в грошах, щоб оглянути не менше 82 тисяч дітей, щоб вони були можливо, підготовлені для усиновлення російськими громадянами. Тобто, якщо вони будуть підходити за здоров'ям, вони будуть відправлені в Росію. А якщо ні, вони будуть залишатися в сиротських домах саме під окупацією на території окупованої частини України. On October 22nd, the Russian Federation government has issued Uh, in order to subsidize the currently occupied uh, Donetsk and Luhansk territories, so the so-called Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic, and also at the time Kherson Oblast, to subsidize their healthcare facility to uh, perform health check on no less than um, 82,000 of children to check their health, and if uh, they pass, they are to be sent to Russia to be adopted, and if they don't, they remain in orphanages in the occupied territories. And this is necessary to do this until 31 February. So they are very fast. And this order says that these health checks are to be performed before December 31st. So these guys are really in a hurry. Тому це такі дії Російської Федерації відносно дітей українців, вони є геноцидом українського народу, і потрібно це визнавати, і ці докази є, і потрібно покарання тим, хто організує такі злочини. 
So these actions uh, of the government of the Russian Federation against the Ukrainian children are the crimes and uh, there is the evidence. And so there needs to be a court in punishment to those who organize these crimes of genocide against the Ukrainian people. За даними генпрокурора, в початку повномасштабного вторгнення Росії в Україну зафіксовано понад 52 тисячі злочинів агресії та військових злочинів. According to the General Prosecutor's Office, uh, since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, over 52,000 of crimes of aggression and war crimes have been documented. З них 50 тисяч – це порушення законів і звичаїв війни, куди входять, зокрема, жорстоке поводження з військовополоненими та цивільним населенням. Out of them, the 50,000 is the violation of laws and customs of war, which includes also violent handling of uh, the POWs or civilian population. Зібрані докази можуть і будуть використовуватися у справі України проти Росії про геноцид, яка вже розглядається Міжнародним судом ООН. This collected evidence can and will be used in the case Ukraine against Russia on genocide that is already in the International Court of Justice. Але поки Росія залишається членом ООН, вона зможе вітувати будь-які рішення в рамках ООН. But as long as Russia remains the UN member, it will be able to veto any resolution adopted by the UN. Військові злочини та військо та злочини це компетенція міжнародного кримінального суду, який вже розпочав розслідування прокурор Харім Хам. War crimes and crimes against humanity are um, judged by the International Criminal Court and the accordion investigation has already been started by uh, ICC prosecutor Karim Khan. Але розслідування злочину агресії це не підлягає повноваж... не входить в повноваження цього міжнародного кримінального суду. However, the ICC cannot investigate and judge the crime of aggression. І тому ще 4 березня Україна запропонувала створення спеціального міжнародного або гібридного трибуналу для розслідування злочинної агресії, типу Нюрнберг 2.0. Uh, this is why back on March 4 Ukraine offered to create a special international or hybrid tribunal to investigate the crime of aggression, something like Nuremberg uh, 20. Належне покарання керівництва Російської Федерації та всіх причетних до злочинів в Україні це справа честі для всього цивілізованого світу. To accordingly punish the authorities of the Russian Federation and everybody who is related to the crimes committed in Ukraine is the matter of dignity for the entire civilized world. І ми всі маємо докласти максимум зусиль, щоб прошивка влада та виконавці злочинів опинилися на лаві підсудних. And all of us must make all possible effort so that the Russian authorities and those who committed the crimes are punished for these crimes. Справедливість потрібна не лише Україні, вона потрібна всім країнам, як доказ неповторення військових нападів на держави, масових вбивств та гарантія безпеки цілої планети. It is not only the Ukraine that the Ukraine that needs justice. Uh, justice is needed for all the countries as proof that such attacks on countries, uh, mass killings do not repeat anymore and as a guarantee of security for the entire planet. А ми продовжуємо свою боротьбу. Я очолюю uh, Український центр захисту прав людини, який створив новий проект Центр підтримки полонених та їх сімей. And we are continuing our fight. I'm heading the Ukrainian Center for Protection of Human Rights that uh, now opened a new project on uh, the rights of POWs and their families. Ми uh, надаємо юридичні консультації, адвокатську підтримку і пошук полонених в тому числі. We provide legal consultations, we provide uh, lawyer support and also we take part in searching for POWs. І uh, до нас дуже ну, можна достукатись дуже швидко. Ми організовуємо без, безоплатну гарячу лінію за підтримку благодійників. І тому пропонуємо телефонувати нам, повідомляти про військові злочини, а ми будемо їх доносити світу, щоб Україна перемогла і кожен злочинець був покараний. And it is very easy to reach us. We have organized with the help of our donors a free 
hotline and you can reach us by the phone you can inform us about the war crimes and we will be telling the world about them so that the world knew about them and uh, hoping for ukraine's victory дуже вдячна народам світу дуже вдячна владам цих народів урядам які приймають рішення на підтримку України додають нам зброю тим самим ви захищаєте не тільки українців і Україну ви захищаєте себе я вам дуже вдячна I'm very grateful to the populations of different countries of the world to the governments that support Ukraine that adopt decisions to provide weapons to Ukraine doing so you're not only protecting Ukraine you're protecting yourselves and extremely grateful to you Дякую Thank you. Не слышно ничего. Или надо выключить? No, он, он mm -hmm. Дякую, дякую. Thank you very much. Uh, so every day we can see uh, in media, in European media, many terrifying uh, photos. However, uh, this landscape uh, which you presented to us uh, is uh, much more terrifying uh, that uh, uh, media can uh, show uh, during the news uh, and uh, other programs. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, please stay with us if it's possible, uh, because I'm sure that uh, uh, there will be uh, many questions uh, uh, to your, your presentation. Let's jump to the next uh, um, uh, speaker, uh, because we must remember that uh, the Russian aggression started in 2014, in fact. So uh, we have uh, on this session Yevgeny Yaroshenko from Crimea SOS. Uh, uh, Yevgeny, can you hear me? Uh, uh, yep, I can hear you well. And you? Okay. Can you can you compare can you compare this uh, this uh, situation after 2014 and uh, uh, full scale war after uh, February uh, 2022 from the uh, human rights perspective? Do you? Uh, this is only scale, or if, uh, we can say that uh, there are some other uh, important uh, issues. Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting uh, me uh, to this uh, event. Uh, thank you very much for giving the floor. It's a great honor for me to express our view on what is going on uh, in uh, occupied Crimea and in Ukraine in general. First of all, I'd like to mention that what Russia has done in Ukraine and continues doing against my country amounts to violation of all of the 10 principles of international law, guiding interstate relations. Events in Bucha, Mariupol, Izum and other atrocities could have been avoided if the international community had reacted decisively to the Russians' uh, attempted annexation of Crimea and invasion in Donbass in 2014. First cases of enforced disappearances, torture, unlawful imprisonment and other atrocities were already visible in the first days of Russian occupation of Crimea, but only few international stakeholders paid due attention to this practice. As a leading organization that monitors the situation in Crimea, we observe that each year the human rights situation in the peninsula is increasingly deteriorating. More and more persons in Crimea are becoming political prisoners. According to our data, at least 146 persons are, are now being uh, prosecuted on politically motivated criminal charges. 1,339 years and two months. This is a total imprisonment for persons uh, who have been already sentenced on politically motivate, motivated charges and are still behind the bars. Uh, this year, Russia used Crimea as a bridgehead for the invasion of mainland Ukraine. According to some data, around 700 missiles were launched from the occupied peninsula uh, to, uh, in order to strike uh, 
civilians in cities and set settlements in uh, mainland Ukraine. In the first days of the full-scale invasion, Russia tightened its administrative and criminal legislation that it continues to apply in Crimea contrary to international humanitarian law. Tightening legislation has created new grounds for political repression in Crimea, in particular on allegedly discrediting the Russian army, saying no war, uh, Slava Ukraini, glory to Ukraine, or removing stickers with Z symbols from cars are common ground to find persons for allegedly discrediting the Russian army. There are at least 160 court rulings in Crimea in administrative cases on allegedly discrediting the Russian army. Uh, meanwhile, occupation authorities conduct a large-scale propaganda for war at schools, university, and other public places. For instance, uh, heads of uh, units of occupation bodies are demanded to publish at least three posts daily with the approval of the so-called special military operation. Independent Crimean lawyers who protect the interests of political prisoners are suffering an unprecedented, uh, an unprecedented pressure this year. In May, four Crimean lawyers were, were detained. Three of them were subjected to several days of administrative arrest. This August, three human rights defenders were deprived of their lawyer's uh, status, having created uh, a risk for many Crimean political prisoners being left without necessary legal aid. Moreover, phone numbers of at least nine Crimean lawyers were blocked at a time when Russian security agencies came to Crimean Tatar houses uh, with mass searches this August. Uh, occupants also abduct residents of mainland Ukraine and forcibly transfer them to uh, the pretrial detention facilities in Crimea. Uh, many of them are accused of trumped up charges and experience torture. Recently, the uh, occup uh, occupying authorities in Crimea opened a new pretrial detention facility. Uh, it's uh, uh, oriented on uh, persons who were forcibly transferred from mainland Ukraine. There is uh, more than 100 of such persons, and the absolute majority of them uh, are neither prisoners of war nor suspects in uh, criminal offenses. Lawyers are denied of their access to uh, these persons. Uh, the latest wave of arbitrariness in Crimea is connected with the so-called partial mobilization, which began in late September. Uh, before this time, occupation authorities have already conducted 15 conscription campaigns, which, are, uh, which amount to war crimes, and uh, cons illegally conscripted up to uh, 40,000 Crimeans into the Russian army. Uh, some of them were observed in warfare against their own country. Uh, mobilization uh, significantly increased the number of Ukrainian citizens who uh, become victims of these war crimes. Moreover, forcible mobilization in occupied Crimea is outright discriminatory, directed mainly against the Crimean Tatar community. According to our observations, Crimean Tatars who constitute up to 15% of Crimean Tatar populations in some settlements receive the absolute majority of uh, summonses. For instance, uh, there is a settlement where only one out of 28 summonses was handed to a non-Crimean Tatars. Uh, I also would like to mention that um, Russia uh, has, um, out of four core international crimes, uh, before the 24th February, uh, at least three of them have already been uh, committed. First, it's the crime of aggression, which was obviously committed in early 2014. Uh, second, war crimes, numerous war crimes, which uh, started occurring both in Crimea and uh, Donbass. The easiest war crime to prove are 
uh, unlawful conscription into the occupation army and forcible transfer of population from the occupied territory. Uh, uh, there are also credible evidence that crimes against humanity, such as uh, torture, deportations, uh, have been uh, committed both in uh, Crimea and Donbass. And now, after what uh, we have seen in Bucha, in Mariupol, in other places, um, made many human rights uh, activists to consider whether these acts uh, fall under the definition of the crime of genocide. By the way, today is the uh, International uh, Genocide Commemoration Day, which uh, actually um, is neighboring to tomorrow's Human Rights Day. And uh, we are talking about uh, huge atrocities which are uh, continue being committed in uh, my, my country. And now I'd like to uh, ask a question. What the international community have done to stop the arbitrariness and atrocities in Crimea as well as in other occupied territories of Ukraine? I would like to annun announce several recommendations for the international community on how to stop these atrocities and restore peace in Europe. First, the state should impose new sectoral uh, and more efficient sanctions against various sectors of Russia's economy. None of the sanctions uh, introduced against the Russian Federation in connection with aggression against Ukraine should be lifted until the return of Crimea. Second, states should introduce personal sanctions against judges, prosecutors, investigators, FSB employees, heads of penitentiary institutions and uh, other persons involved in gross human rights violations uh, in uh, uh, occupied territories of Ukraine. For instance, our organization Crimea SOS uh, compiled a list of 87 judges who deliver sentences to Crimean political uh, prisoners or issue penalties in politically motivated administrative charges. Next, uh, foreign states and international organizations should provide financial, psychological, and informational support to victims of political repressions in Crimea, as well as to family members of political prisoners and victims of enforced disappearances. The state should prosecute perpetrators of war crimes uh, in Ukraine under the Geneva Conventions and cooperate with the law enforcement agencies of Ukraine in the investigation. Uh, Crimea SOS created a register of 20 so-called military commissars who are directly involved in a war crime in the form of forcible conscription of residents of occupied Crimea into the Russian army. Russia's defined uh, a disregard of almost all norms of international law shows that the only way to stop massive violation of human rights in occupied Crimea is the promptest possible deoccupation of the peninsula with the help of available diplomatic sanctions and legal measures, including the right to defense provided in Article 51 of the UN Charter. Please remember that delaying, delaying the deoccupation of Crimea and other territories of Ukraine will only lead to an increase in the scale of war crime and the number of their victims. In addition, it is impossible to ensure the security of Ukraine, the whole Black Sea Basin, Europe and the entire world without the deoccupation of Crimea. Uh, impunity for Russia is a fertile soil for other states to resort to revising the borders, including with the help of military force. Impunity for perpetrators of war crimes and crimes against humanity in Crimea and other occupied territories will encourage mass atrocities in, uh, in other countries and regions. Uh, thank you for your attention.
Professor, Professor, uh, the microphone. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I switch off my microphone. Uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for your uh, presentation. Um, I hope that uh, Olesia Nikolenka is uh, with us. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I'm oh, great, great. Uh, uh, let me introduce uh, Olesia. Uh, she graduated the uh, Institute of Journalism uh, at National Torah Shevchenko University of Kiev and uh, which uh, uh, make us very proud. Faculty of Political Science and Journalism at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań, Poland. And now um, Olesia works uh, in the press uh, unit, press service of the Office of the Prosecutor General of Ukraine. So, um, Olesia, uh, we can uh, see many photos uh, from such a place like uh, Bucha, Irpin, Hostomel, Mariupol and other cities. Uh, so, uh, do you think that uh, this uh, um, Russian crimes we can be qualified as a genocide and uh, um, General Prosecutor's Office uh, of Ukraine is uh, uh, ongoing such uh, proceeding uh, on this uh, issue? Thank you for passing the floor. Warm okay, Olesha, the floor is yours. Yeah. Yes, my uh, warm greetings from Kiev, and I'm also very proud to be graduated from the Adam Mickiewicz University. And um, today, I have on, to be honest with you, I was not sure that I will be able to attend the seminar because uh, you know living in ukraine today is a challenge of uh, finding electricity and the working internet uh, why this is happening is uh, because uh, russia decided to weaponize winter and uh, with the massive uh, missile attacks uh, against critical infrastructure uh, they want to starve terrorize and freeze our people, but uh, our defenders and people on the occupied territories are suffering, so we don't complain. And uh, these actions together with the deportation of Ukrainian children and the adoption of them on, in Russian families are the clear signs of the genocide. That is what uh, Prosecutor General's office uh, is uh, taking care about. And uh, we have, uh, for now, uh, Ms. Denisova has mentioned 52,000 uh, war crimes committed. That is correct uh, number. Uh, and in general, more than 70,000 crimes related to the Russian aggressive war were committed for now, but uh, the crimes are ongoing. And uh, also at this moment, while we are talking on this meeting, uh, it may happen that the numbers will grow. And uh, we have to remember that those numbers are also don't include uh, the occupied territories because we don't have access there and prosecutors together with the investigation investigators can only guess of uh, what we will see when we will deoccupy our territories because the pattern of the aggressor uh, behavior and the crimes committed is same when we saw Bucha, we all were shocked and pictures are still uh, terrifying. But then we have entered the Haki region and, and so same. Then we have entered the uh, other regions and we saw sometimes even worse. Uh, they, of course, they torture, they kill our children. Uh, they commit other, they commit sexual crimes, which is Ms. Denisova has gave you a very full view of this. 
Uh, and uh, here, Mr. Uh, Yaroshenko was totally right that the 24th February would not happen if Russia would be accountable for the crimes done in 2014. Also, Syria would not happen if Russia would be punished for the crimes and for the war she started before. And this is what civil, all the civilized world has to think about. Because uh, now in Ukraine we see that uh, there is not a single article of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights that Russia has not violated. And uh, prosecutors uh, and the investigators and experts weapons, but they fight every day on the uh, legal uh, front line and they are heroes without weapons. For now, uh, with such uh, high numbers of the cases that are registered, the num when we say that we have uh, for now identified 231 sacks of war crimes. We have issued 67 indictments and attained 16 convictions. People may say that this is very small number, but we have to remember that this is happening right now in the middle of the aggressive war. And the job that the prosecutors and investigators do is something incredible because they enter the, the occupied territories just after the defenders. And uh, they risk their life. And unfortunately, we also have cases where, where when the prosecutors were killed and we have lost some of them. Uh, this is true that Ukraine is actively working with the International Criminal Court and uh, other partners of Ukraine that uh, help us to with the documentation and investigation of the war crimes. We are grateful for that and we are sure that this cooperation will be fruitful. But uh, what we need to remember is the special tribunal for the crime of aggression is the only way to have Putin accountable for the crime of aggression. Because uh, this is also true that uh, the International Criminal Court can work only with the uh, crime, war crimes, crimes against the humanity and genocide. And we will, of course, continue in this. But this special tribunal is something that can stop the aggressor forever. Is the only thing that can give us the guarantee that the war will not continue. Ukraine is ready to be the border between Russia and the Euro Europe and fight on our territory with your, of course, incredible support. But we cannot guarantee that this, this will not happen again if we don't punish this. This is very important for us, but also for all the world. Because you know, some is this uh, this uh, tribunal is a political decision of states. It's not something that we have uh, in uh, international law. Of course, we have with the United Nations, but we all know that the Russia will just block this and it's done. So this should happen through the political decision of the countries. And uh, of course, some politicians say now that um, this is not possible. But on 24th February, we have heard that it is not possible for Ukraine to exist for more than 72 hours. Then we heard that it is not possible to receive weapons. 
And now we're still here without uh, electricity, but blessing God that we wake up not in Russia every morning. So together with your support, every person, because what we did while Ukraine is receiving this incredible support is because all the world stays together with us, not only on a state level, but on a human level. And together with you, with the people that will say, yes, we need this tribunal and we'll apply to their states to have it, we will do this. I'm sure that uh, we can make it possible. Ukraine has no, uh, she is sure about this. Uh, we ask every one of you to support Ukraine to save the future of all the world. And um, I'm there to say that today, international community has a moral ob obligation to hold Kremlin accountable for the atrocities. Thank you. Microphone again. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, again, I'm sorry. Once again, thank you very much uh, for your for your speech. Uh, one of the reason uh, Putin's reasons uh, of this war uh, was tensions uh, between uh, Russian and uh, Ukrainian uh, languages. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, among our uh, speakers. Uh, Professor Bartosz Hordecki from Adam Mickiewicz University, expert in linguistic uh, policy, um, who I hope uh, will try to explain uh, this uh, topic. Uh, professor Bartosz Hordecki, let me introduce uh, Shorber Shorty. Uh, he's a professor at Faculty of Political Science, Journalism at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań. Member, a member of executive board of the research committee uh, 50, politics and language, uh, international political science association, specialize uh, in studies on language, politics and policies, political philosophy and political rhetorics. Uh, his research also concern, concerns uh, the evolution of political and legal cultures, as well as transformation of key concepts and methodological approach, uh, approaches in political and media studies. Um, Professor Hordecki uh, um, proposed uh, such a topic, linguistic rights in the Russian Federation's uh, geopolitical narrative, misreading uh, and abuses. Uh, Bartosz, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Andrzej, for uh, this uh, introduction and uh, uh, for giving me an opportunity to be here and to uh, uh, say something about uh, my topic. Um, I've got a presentation, uh, but uh, this is a new environment for me, I must confess. So I will try to open it, but hmm. uh, it is um, uh, uploaded now, but uh, what should I do to open it? That's a good question. Uh, you, you can, any, you can, See, yeah, on the right side, uh, such uh, button share content, and uh, share content, button share please, content. Please, uh, on the right, yeah, on the right, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. On the right, yeah, there is uh, such uh, uh, magenta color of a button, uh, collaborate panel, and there is a share content uh, button. Unfortunately, I on the see. right, uh, you on can you right, can yes. see the, the the arrows, yeah. Please, yes, the uh, arrow, yes. please uh, push the button, and there, yeah, and here is the uh, uh, share the, content, the down, yes, yes. Uh, button, yes, share content. Yes, and yeah. I have uploaded. Yes, and I have and uploaded this. Yes, and I can see it. Yeah. it's uploaded already. Yes, and now I need to open it. Okay, I suppose. It should work. Great. Thank yes. You. yes. So, so for for this. Yeah, um, we can uh, see it. Okay. Inconvenience. Yeah. Yes. So we can see. Yes, and it's a long presentation. Bartosz, the floor yes, is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, uh, it's a long presentation. I will not be presenting uh, 
the wholeness uh, of what I've prepared, yes, uh, but I have decided to make a long presentation just to uh, show you that um, the topic I will be uh, uh, presenting is just uh, a tip of an iceberg. Well, my presentation is about narratives, uh, is about uh, ideological meaning of narratives and about ideological reshaping uh, uh, our worldviews by narratives, yes? And uh, it's also about uh, employing narratives by authorities and uh, uh, government agendas uh, to reshape our mindsets uh, with help of narratives, yes? So it's a broad topic, deep topic, very complex one. And the presentation should give uh, only a flavor of uh, how complicated is the situation and uh, some uh, highlights. And uh, maybe I will start um, uh, before showing slides, yes? I will start with uh, um, reminding you that uh, in July 2021, Putin um, published an article claiming that uh, there is no, um, uh, uh, there is no, uh, there is no difference between Ukrainians and Russians. He claimed that uh, we uh, should talk about the one nation. Uh, okay, there are uh, uh, different uh, uh, regional, uh, we could say, uh, uh, elements uh, which we can observe in Ukraine and in Russia, but in fact, according to uh, Putin, uh, this is uh, the same, yes. and. Uh, one of the arguments given uh, given by him in this uh, article, this argument was really elaborated and it was uh, repeated like a mantra uh, there, was that uh, there is not such a thing like a Ukrainian language. And uh, if Ukrainians claim that they've got a, a separate language uh, from Russian, which is Ukrainian, it means that uh, they are just uh, fascist and they uh, follow those uh, Western inventions, uh, which uh, are uh, just uh, the root of uh, the whole evil which we have in the region, yes? So the problem is that uh, 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 in case of this Russian narrative, uh, we've got a production of a justification of aggression, yes? So this uh, linguistic uh, narrative produced uh, by Russia uh, was produced by two decades and more uh, as a justification to make this uh, uh, intervention, invasion, and aggression, yes? And this is the most horrible thing I would like to uh, focus on during my presentation. And um, uh, the point is that um, uh, it was possible to create uh, such a narrative about uh, um, uh, language policy and also linguistic rights, which should be protected by the Russian, uh, according to the Russian president. It was possible because um, uh, there is a strong conviction in uh, Russian culture, and I could uh, give plenty of examples, uh, uh, but uh, uh, we have no time for this. Plenty of examples of very prominent uh, representatives of Russian cultures who claimed, uh, who were convinced that there is a strict uh, uh, relation between language and between Russianness, and it's something uh, which is very precious and. Uh, that the greatness of this Russian language uh, uh, should be uh, read uh, as the main uh, uh, proof uh, of the fact that the Russia should be great. And in reverse, yes, the greatness of Russia, uh, uh, the hugeness of its uh, territory should be a proof that uh, uh, the Russian language is, uh, is so great and, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, magnificent. Uh, and um, uh, this is um, uh, the point uh, I wanted to uh, rise up during my presentation, that this conviction that uh, the Russian language is the best one, yes, is um, uh, the root of a, a narrative which is very aggressive, uh, offensive, and uh, which is used by uh, the authorities of the Russian Federation as one of the justifications of doing this uh, harmful things uh, uh, in Ukraine. And uh, maybe uh, here we've got um, the main uh, uh, aims of uh, uh, my presentation, yes. So what I'm doing, and uh, I've got a lot of um, uh, ex experience in this field, yes, is an analysis and interpretation of the narrative created and promoted by the authorities of the Russian Federation in connection with its language policy, yes. And I'm doing this on many different levels 
uh, with many documents, yes. And the point is that we've got a very strong uh, uh, pattern of thinking about language and about uh, language rights by Russians, uh, by uh, today's Russian authorities. And this pattern is something what uh, 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 what should be changed? Yes, because uh, this is a source of many uh, uh, failed decisions and uh, um, uh, aggression which is done by this country. Uh, so here we've got uh, uh, a very interesting uh, quotation from Olga Tokarczuk, her Nobel Prize lecturer. Yes, this is uh, only about uh, 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 the power of narratives. Uh, yes, and uh, how strong can be narratives uh, employed uh, to make political reasons. And uh, this is uh, also something what uh, happens if we talk about uh, uh, about this uh, narrative in language policy produced by many different agendas by the Russian uh, Federation. Uh, and um, uh, I will skip uh, some uh, uh, slides um, uh, which uh, just show the complexity of uh, uh, the whole issue. And I will go to some conclusions, yes, but uh, I would like to... Uh, uh, assure you that these conclusions, as I said, they are based on a very broad and uh, really deeply analyzed by me uh, material, which was produced by the Russian Federation from the 90s of the 20th century. Yes, and this material has a uh, very different forms and faces. Yes, so for example, we are talking about legal acts, we are talking about uh, um, declarations, we are talking uh, uh, we are talking um, uh, uh, about um, uh, text uh, in the media, we are talking about uh, text delivered um, uh, by uh, novelists, uh, uh, poets, and so on and so on. Yes, so we are talking about the complex discourse, which uh, creates a, a very uh, strange, dangerous, and harmful uh, uh, conclusions. So uh, let me focus first of all uh, on the uh, constitution of the Russian Federation. And uh, it has to be noticed that this constitution has been changed in 2020. Uh, in July, uh, there were a lot of amendments, yes, but uh, um, uh, there are important and crucial amendments uh, concerning this narrative in language policy proposed by Russia. And um, uh, uh, first of all, article, article, uh, article, article. Uh, something is wrong with this presentation. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Article 68. Okay. So um, I've highlighted uh, the moment which was added by Putin because it was his initiative and uh, his people uh, to uh, the article 68, which is exactly about language policy. And we can see the state language of the Russian Federation in all of its territory shall be Russian language. And this is what has been added as a language of the state constituting nation, a member of the multinational union of equal nations of the Russian Federation. Yes. So it's important that in July we've got this amendment and we've got a category of the state constitution nation. I don't know what is it, yes, but we know that this state constituting nation, so we could uh, think the basics of the Russian Federation, this nation speaks Russian. So uh, this article on the moral level uh, claimed that it's uh, extremely important to protect Russian language and not only uh, and not only um, uh, inside the Russian Federation, but what is most important uh, during my today's presentation, also outside. And here we've got Article 69. This is the clue. Uh, point three, the Russian Federation provides support to compatriots living abroad in exercising their rights, ensuring protection of their interests and preserving all Russian cultural identity. And if we jump uh, to those uh, announcements done uh, by Putin, uh, um, in the face of uh, the fully fledged uh, invasion in the Russian Federation, he said strictly, we are going there in Ukraine because uh, according to us rights, uh, linguistic rights of uh, Russian people in Ukraine are violated and that's why we have to intervene. Yes, so again, yes, you can see it's a clear justification of this aggression. Yes, so we've got uh, a misreading, 
uh, abuse of the concept of uh, linguistic right, which is so important uh, in the contemporary international system. And it was taken, abused and misinterpreted by Putin to uh, create and to fulfill his own aggressive goals. And that's uh, the point uh, of uh, this uh, um, uh, narrative, Russian narrative in language policy of contemporary times, yes? That they are taking um, a very uh, important and uh, meaningful concepts and uh, change them uh, just to uh, uh, provide the justifications for their, for their neo-imperial um, uh, uh, purposes and uh, uh, policies and uh, acts. Uh, and uh, going um, a bit further, um, uh, I would like to give some conclusions, yes, and to be uh, very strict and uh, short, I will just uh, read those, conclu uh, to those, those conclusions, yes. So, on the basis of those documents I have analyzed, yes, we can say that contemporary Russian narrative and language policy is not a balanced narrative and contains many deliberate left gaps. Uh, it's just manipulative, as uh, in long periods of the USSR's history, it moves decisively towards the revitalization of specific old patterns and schemes that were still developed in the Russian Empire, belongs to a wide range of symbolic practices through which the Russian state tries to tame the trauma associated with the collapse of the USSR and the socio-political transformation in the Russia after 1999. One, is an ideological instrument through which the federal authorities seek to arouse a sense of insecurity among Russians and the belief in a deep conflict between Russian culture and the cultures of the so-called West. Yes, so I would like to show you that this narrative is employed in creating the, this Russian propaganda, which uh, is the part of the problem, yes? Uh, if we don't uh, see this uh, propaganda, we will not be able to reconcile the situation with Russia because um, it is, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, um, it is um, uh, in the situation of a deep misreading, yes, and it's uh, hard uh, to talk with Russia uh, as far as this uh, misreading is uh, um, uh, spread uh, by the authorities. Let's go further. In the light of contemporary Russian narrative in language policy, the Russian language is presented as, it's uh, really interesting, but we have no time for this, yes? But it's about how uh, Russians perceive uh, the Russian authorities, not Russians, but the Russian authorities, how they perceive language and what they spread uh, through the media about the language, yes? So the language is showed as a beloved uh, language. Russian is the most important. Other languages as, are also important, yes? But when something is interpreted by Putin and uh, by Russian agenda, us as a situation of conflict between Russian and other languages, then there is no doubt according to this narrative and uh, the, the priority of Russian is undoubtedly in this moment, yes? And this is, for example, uh, the part of the story about uh, how uh, Russia should intervene in Ukraine, yes? Because of the interest of the Russian language, yes, uh, we should not focus on Ukrainian language, which is only a dialect. Uh, but we uh, should rather focus uh, on Russian language and uh, its interests. So it is showed as a great and powerful reality, deriving uh, to be regarded as the unavailable foundation of Russianness, a particularly valuable resource of cultural identity, especially in the conditions of increasing globalization. And uh, uh, the Russian language is also treated as a soft power, yes? So as a uh, means which should be spread by Russians among the world, just to um, uh, increase the influence uh, of uh, Russia in the world. And if the world is not uh, open to uh, Russian and Russianness, well, it has to be forced because uh, it uh, for the sake of the world. And uh, it is also perceived as a, as a fundamental value. And maybe uh, because time is speeding and probably I need to go to the end, yes? So maybe just... Um, uh, to show you in a nutshell, yes, what is this position I'm talking about, yes. Uh, I have taken a quotation uh, 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 which uh, is provided not by politicians, but by a, a leading social linguist in the Russian Federation. This is uh, Vladimir Alpatov, uh, treated uh, uh, as a real authority in uh, uh, questions uh, of language policy. And Alpatov in 2000, yes, in 2000, he gave such a quotation. And this quotation, uh, in a nutshell, shows, yes, how uh, 
uh, this uh, Russian narrative in language policy is built and how through the lens of this narrative, uh, the Russian authorities perceive the world of languages. And this quotation is like that. Uh, this is the quotation from Alpatov, his words. Yes, so far, of course, translated uh, uh, from Russian into English. So far, we have proceeded from one basic assumption. Yes, this is the conclusion of his book, uh, uh, which many authors of the past years consider to be an axiom, namely that all 14 states, of course, he is talking about uh, those post-Soviet republics, uh, except of Russia, that all 14 states exist in earnest and for the long term. Such an option cannot be ruled out if only because the world's most powerful states are pushing hard for its realization. However, life has taught us to be skeptical towards formulas of the four seriously and four longer type, indisputably, and amorphous CIS as experience uh, uh, Yenjay, I'm sorry, I uh, feel uh, uh, in the background uh, the voice of uh, things you are doing, uh, uh, but I'm going to... I'm end. sorry, Thank I'm sorry. Okay. Indisputably, an amorphous CIS, as experience has shown, can do little to protect the Russian-speaking population outside Russia or to end the alphabet war in Transnistria. And further, however, the situation may change with a new change of national borders, a possibility that should not be excluded. It is difficult to believe in the possibility of a reintegration of the USSR within its past borders. But there are no uh, grounds for saying that the last empire has disintegrated forever and that not a single one of the 14 states will ever reunite with Russia again. Of course, we refrain from specific predictions. Nevertheless, the prospects for the linguistic situation depend primarily on whether or not a country survives on the world map. So 2000, yes, and we've got an open thread uh, in the book of the social linguist in Russia, yes, that Russia will be thinking about developing its language policy in that way that uh, uh, some parts uh, of the former uh, Soviet Union should be re reunited with Russia. Yes, so we are talking about a very complex phenomenon built for uh, almost three decades. And now uh, we observe uh, the fruits of this uh, ideological work, which was done uh, by uh, uh, Russian authorities uh, during the uh, uh, last uh, three decades. It's very sad, yes, but it has to be highlighted. Um, uh, as I said, it's only the tip of an iceberg, yes. And uh, uh, I think uh, this is a very important condition uh, of real change in Russia, that this narrative and this way of thinking that Russian is the greatest language uh, over the world, it has to be changed if we think about new Russia, which will be more democratic and more open for human rights. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, for uh, having the possibility to present. Thank you very much uh, for these uh, presentations. Uh, you must know that uh, Bartosz published last year a very uh, fascinating book about uh, linguist, Russian linguistic policy. I'm sure that uh, uh, whether if, uh, analysts uh, from international organizations or even uh, uh, Secret Service from Western countries uh, read this book. Uh, Ariel, I hope that uh, I, I'm sure that uh, they uh, should know that uh, this invasion will be possible. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, once again, uh, Bartosz. Uh, we have uh, some questions uh, here in the chat. Uh, so uh, let's start from the um, question from Maria Kanana. Uh, thank you very much for this webinar. My question is to all speakers. In your opinion, why organizations such as Amnesty International became so ineffective in time of war? What problems do you see in their work? Um, who will be ready to answer on this question from our speaker? And maybe uh, jump to the second question. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Ms. Ludmila Denisova. Uh, yes. Yes, Ms. Denisova, please. Yeah, sure. 
Знаєте, я маю досвід співпраці з такою організацією, як Amnesty International. Коли я була в, навесні в Давосі і приймала участь в там, заходах на цьому економічному форумі, і е, у мене був такий брифінг разом з заступником е, цього керівника Amnesty International всього, е, і е, мене дуже здивувала його позиція, коли він нічого не розповідав про злочини Російської Федерації на території України, хоча тематика була якраз присвячена злочинам. You know, I have experience of cooperating with such organization as Amnesty International. When I was in Davos uh, in spring on this economic forum, I had a briefing together with the deputy head of this organization, uh, the, the head office, and I was very surprised that he did not uh, mention anything about uh, war crimes that had been committed, although the topic that we were speaking on, it was uh, closely related to this. На мої питання, конкретне питання щодо цих фіксацій злочинів, де вони були, наприклад, тоді в Бучі, в Ірпіні, він відповідав так, що це припущення, це може бути ще не росіяни, це можуть бути якісь черті, які вдруг приїхали в Україну і щось там натворили, скоїли. And when I asked directly uh, on documenting the war crimes at the time in spring, uh, we were talking about Bucha, about Rapin, he said that, well, these are the uh, assumed crimes, the alleged crimes, yet they, it has not been proven. It has not been proven that these were the Russians, that it could have been just some random people who randomly came to Ukraine and committed some random crimes. Потім ми всі побачили той звіт, який Amnesty International опублікувала і всім довела, що нібито це Україна вінна і українські військові в якихось злочинах. Це була дуже дивна ситуація. And then all of us saw the report that Amnesty published uh, that seemingly Uh, the Ukrainian military were guilty and Ukraine was guilty and this uh, was a very weird situation. Але в той час і керівниця цього української делегації, українського представництва подала відставку. But на фоні цього скандалу. At the same time when the scandal happened, the head of the Ukrainian office resigned. Але потрібно зріти в корінь. За всім цим стоять кошти і кошти Російської Федерації. But we need uh, to look at the root of this. Behind all of this is the money, and this is the money of the Russian Federation. So we can talk about that the International Red Cross is not very effective, as they themselves admit that it is a very impotent organization. Uh, we can also say that you know, RCRC have not been very effective lately, and as they themselves say, they are quite an impotent organization. So we should also look at where the cost of the Russian Federation We also need to look at the root of this and to look for Russian money there. Тому я думаю, що тут потрібно все ж таки цим міжнародним установам, цим державам, які фінансують такі організації, як Міжнародний Червоний Хрест, як які донатять Amnesty International і інші правозахисні міжнародні організації, треба дивитися про звіти цих організацій, що взагалі вони роблять і що і як як вони артикулюють на сьогодні і дають оцінку цим злочинам, які коє Російська Федерація не тільки в Україні, а по всьому світу. That's why I think that the countries that uh, support, that donate to these organizations, to such organizations as Amnesty International or ICRC, they need to look uh, deeper into the reports that these organizations are producing and how they are evaluating the crimes that the Russian Federation is committing today not only in Ukraine but all over the world. Тільки в мене є досвід співпраці з міжнародним червоним хрестом ще в 18-му році. Have experience of cooperating with ICRC back in 2018. Коли я приїжджала в Російську Федерацію відвідати пана Сенцова, Олега Сенцова, який ще тоді відбував покарання в Російській Федерації. It was when I visited the Russian Federation uh, to see Oleg Sentsov, who at the time was still imprisoned in the Russian Federation. Я хотіла зустрітися з представниками російського представництва Міжнародного Червоного Хреста. Мені було відмовлено. 
and I wanted to meet the representatives of the Russian office of ICRC, and uh, I heard a, a no. I was refused to do it. Але я хотіла тільки запитати, чому саме в Криму, в окупованому на той час і на цей час Російської Федерації, є представництво московського офісу. Тобто це практично визнання міжнародним Червоним Христом було, що Крим це Росія. But what I wanted to ask them was this one question: why in Crimea that was occupied at that time and is still occupied now? There was uh, a representation, representatives from the Moscow office of ICRC, because in fact this means that ICRC acknowledges uh, Crimea as part of the Russian Federation. Але тільки через те, що я зверталась потім до ці саме спонсорів відомих держав, в тому числі до Швейцарії, які фінансують дуже добре міжнародний червоний хрест, вони закрили це представництво в місті в Криму. And only because I later addressed the donors, the sponsors, the famous uh, states that donate to ICRC, including Switzerland, this uh, representation of uh, Russian ICRC was closed in Crimea. Тому звітування за витрачені кошти перед державами, які донатять такі відомі правозахисні організації, можуть зробити тиск на ці організації, щоб вони були більш активними, а не такими потентними, як сьогодні. So reporting to donor states about where the money is spent and what these organizations are doing, it can pressure these organizations to be more active and not as important as they are now. Дякую. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else uh, would like to answer on this question? Or maybe later. However, we have the second question to, to uh, also Ms. Denisova uh, from Vladislav Zinchenko. Thank you for a very interesting discussion. I would like to ask uh, Ms. Denisova, you conducted a lot of negotiation with Russian representatives. How do you evaluate this experience? Uh, do they play at least uh, some role in their political system or just create a vision of actions? Thank you for the Thank you for this question. Треба сказати, що мої перемовники, які перемови я проводила в 18-му і 19-му роках, були в тому числі, ну, такі представники влади Російської Федерації і представники цих структур, які е, дуже наближені до президента Путіна і дуже впливово приймають багато рішень, які в тому числі розпосюджуються на долю наших громадян, які утримуються в зв'язницях Російської Федерації. I should say that the negotiators that I was in contact with in 2018 and 2019 they are uh, quite high up in the Russian authorities and they are the representatives also of structures that are pretty close to President Putin. And they are making the decisions, uh, quite many decisions, including also the decisions that directly concern the fate of our Ukrainian citizens that are now imprisoned in Russian prisons. Безумовно, треба сказати, що в такій країні, як Російська Федерація, приймає рішення тільки одна людина. Of course, we must say that in the country such as the Russian Federation, it is only one person that makes uh, the final decision. Але виконати це рішення можна різними шляхами. Що й намагаються зробити ці перемовники, які були зі мною в цих перемовах. But you can carry out the decision in different ways. You can implement it in different ways, and this is exactly what the negotiators I was in contact with are trying to do. Вони тиснули на мене, я тиснула на них, і в кінці кінців вони зрозуміли, що тиснути на мене – це неможливо. Я буду тримати цю лінію, ці червоні лінії, які були мені надані спочатку одним президентом, потім іншим президентом. Це стосується крайнього обміну 2019 року. Uh, they were pressuring me, I was pressuring them, and finally they understood that it's impossible to put pressure on me. I will stick to those red lines as the lines that were provided to me first by one president and then by the other president. And I'm talking about this final prison exchange of uh, 2019. 
Можна було б по-різному виконати доручення, але відбулося те, що відбулося. Україна не втратила жодної і не понесла жодної іміджової потери, в тому числі, наприклад, коли звільняли пана Олега Сінцова, то ми не писали ніяких хлопотань і не визнавали ніяку вину. Could have, there could have been different ways to go about it, but it happened the way it happened. And also, uh, for example, when we were free in Oleksensov, we did not write any uh, letters asking about anything, and we did not acknowledge any guilt. And therefore, Ukraine uh, has not uh, sustained any image losses in this process. Все стосувалося рішення Російської Федерації на мою пропозицію, щоб віддати з полонених моряків під мої зобов'язання. І я підписалася за них. І таке рішення ФСБ Російської Федерації було прийнято. This uh, was related uh, to the Russia's decision, uh, to the FSB's decision uh, to give um, the naval, uh, the sailors, the naval officers that were imprisoned uh, to free them on my uh, personal responsibility and I signed uh, personally for them. So they made this decision. Це безумовно досвід і розумієте, що Російська Федерація і в в березні і в травні цього року вже в під час повномасштабного вторгнення вона запропонувала мою кандидатуру для того, щоб я займалася обміном полонених під час уже цього of course this is an experience and in March this year and in May this year the Russian Federation has offered uh, me as a person on the Ukrainian side uh, to be working on the prison exchange але були прийняті такі політичні рішення про які ви знаєте і тому може влада вирішила по-іншому займатися цими питаннями але безумовно це досвід Uh, but the decisions were made that we know of, so maybe the authorities, they decided to uh, go about these issues differently. But, uh, of course, my previous work, it is experience. Висновок такий, що приймає рішення Путін, але виконати вони можуть його по-різному. Все рівно Путін буде у них цар. And the conclusions that I made of it is that Putin is the person making the decision. You can carry out this decision uh, in a different way, but nonetheless, Putin remains the Tsar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for these uh, answers. Uh, any more questions uh, or comments, uh, suggestions? Uh, However, uh, first of all, uh, or maybe now, I would like to, to thank uh, many people. Uh, first of all, uh, all speakers, and also Tatiana Wojdianinska for translation. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to, to thank also for, for Vladislav Zinchenko for, for uh, help in this uh, for, uh, webinar and uh, uh, I'm sorry for my <laughs> Ukrainian however I, I try to say uh, a little bit more Dziękuję za wasze uczest w webinar ja spodziewaję się że ta żachula wina skoro zakończyć się i zapanuje mir i powaha do prawa ludyny Slava Ukraini. Thank you very much uh, once again for joining this session all speakers uh, and uh, on the end, thank you very much to the uh, chair of RC26, uh, Oscar perez uh for hosting us uh, on the uh, university uh, in Madrid uh, uh, digital platform. So uh, thank you very much, uh, all speaker, all uh, uh, people, all attendees. Once again, thank you very much uh, and uh, stay safe. Uh, Take care, and I hope uh, we will see you soon. Once again, thank you very much. Giroyam Slava. Um, you can see some uh, comments uh, on chat also. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I am Oscar Pérez de la Fuente. I only want to say that next year we will celebrate the Human Rights Day with another seminar in RC26 on human rights. Thank you very much, everyone. Excellent discussion and see you. We'll be in touch. Thank you very much, Oscar. Once again, thank you. Have a nice evening.